Welcome to the AgriHive Business Summit Series, presented in partnership with CentreCare CQ as part of the Australian Government Drought Assistance Package. We hope John Cole will give some real insights to make tactical and strategic decisions for your business. The value is in planning around this information. Share this video and join a new wave of resilient businesses as they grow with www.agrihive.com. Have a great day. I'm going to talk to you not as an agribusiness specialist or as an accountant that is expert in analysing spreadsheets and giving you sensitivity analyses of your business. Uh, I'm going to bring it back a little bit and talk about what we might do and why we should work together. Uh, because I think there are collaborative outcomes to be achieved. And Rob, you heard a little bit of this talk in Harvey Bay a little while ago because I'm suggesting that the issues that Jamie is presenting on the table through this forum uh, are issues that concern us all and that we can't leave it um, as, a, as a region or as a nation even uh, to our uh, producers to solve the, the issues they confront by themselves. That's why it's one plus a lot of others. So I want to start by talking a little bit about what I've heard so far. Uh, I'm going to talk about perceptions and uh, talk about strategy and vision and, and why the people stuff's most important. Because as I keep saying to people, I'm a Jeffersonian Democrat. I believe that government is the last resort of civilised man. That is, there's much we do before we go to government. Um, and it starts right here in this room with the people. If we're going to talk about the future of this region, it must germinate in the people of this region. The institute that I'm setting up, and indeed it will be launched next Thursday evening in Parliament House in, in, in uh, Brisbane, is uh, USQ's initiative uh, to organise and focus our research around a couple of areas, uh, the health and well-being of our regions, the business and enterprise of our regions, and of course the learning and development capacities of our regions. It's all about people. Uh, and you'll see we've organised it around the central thing of skills, technology and infrastructure. And we're looking particularly at the role that people, innovation and culture plays. We heard about culture yesterday when Rob talked about living the drought. There was so much embedded value, embedded culture in that statement. It resonated in the afternoon. It kind of set the tone to some degree. It made it not difficult, but it certainly confronted those of us, like myself, who don't confront the drought on a day-to-day -day basis, to put table ideas, because it's something that's experiential and something very close to, to people. The Institute has a vision for regional Australia of capability, and you'll see it's innovation, collaboration and prosperity. Now, I don't believe you can have the, the, the latter one without the first two, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, we are focusing, and we were invited here to talk about this, the enterprise. An enterprise exists in a system, and I'm a systems thinker, and in fact, uh, as I'll show you a little bit about myself, um, I come to this really from the sustainability perspective, um, and uh, while I was an executive director of the EPA for 10 years, um, my job wasn't to regulate people about environmental performance. It was actually to work with local government and industries and smart enterprises showing, in fact, how building sustainable enterprises and sustainable uh, initiatives was actually good, good for everyone, the win-win situation. And I'm suggesting that, you know, when we think about our producers, we, ca we have to think about the district, the region, the sector, and indeed we've got to be capable of working at all of those levels. Coming out here this week, of course, and I heard this yesterday, and Tim, I think, did it beautifully last night. He left us on an optimistic, buoyant note. And that's good. We've got to have that. We've, we've got to have everything else too. And I don't believe that optimism is in, is in itself um, enough to make us resilient or to succeed. It's important. You don't want to be uh, coming to the future uh, totally pessimistic, but... Um, some of you have seen this slide before. Let me say at the outset that I don't come here promising any kind of certainty. In fact, too often in forums like this, we hear people telling us about the future as if they know what's going to happen, and they don't. 
I deal with improbability theory. It's prob uh, probability, improbability. Um, and that is that it's the stuff we don't know that is the most important stuff that we have to bring to the table. And of course, Don Rumsfeld, the former the Secretary of Defence, talked about those known knowns, those known unknowns, and the unknown unknowns. And there's a lot of that at play, always is. And of course, if we can keep this in mind, that learning to learn is hard. We saw that yesterday. We really got back yesterday into what we always do, which is government's got to do something for us. We've got to change this. We've got to do this. We've got to do that. And I hear it. It's the morning tea formula. We go out, we sit down, put all the problems on the, on the, on the, on the table, and then we assign responsibility for those problems. And then in the afternoon, when we come back after lunch, we say, someone else has got to fix it. That happens so often. I'm suggesting that if we keep these things in mind and deal with the future as uncertainty, we will help ourselves. These are the things that CSIRO and others are telling us that we're going to have to work in. Doesn't matter where you live, where you work, what industry you're in, these kinds of things are shaping the future. And as Roger showed us yesterday, with, even with climate variability, the fact is he could have gone a little bit further and talked about the long-term prospects for this particular part of the world is that it's likely to be drier. And that's why I talk about dry land models. If we don't develop models for farming where dry is the norm, and indeed drier is the norm, we don't look at the future as the scientists are telling us. And then there's a whole range of things like this, which all adds up to the fact, as I'll show you, is that the future is largely as it's been for the past quarter of the century, and Tony's just talked about it, it's called tourism, services. 87% of our economy is services. And it's just going that way. All the economic growth in the last quarter of a century, globally, overwhelmingly, has been in services. And you can see there, things like, you know, people are getting older, we're getting divergent demographics, old people, young people, most of the world are young, and yet in this country, and in certain parts of it, uh, some of us are like me, getting older. Now, I started uh, in the government here in Queensland in 1998 with this particular uh, mantra, which was to look at everything always through the, the triple glass, if you like, of being able to look at it. If we're going to talk about sustainability, we can't park this stuff. We can't just say, well, we're going to do the social and economic and forget the environmental. Bernard and I were talking this morning about limits. Oh, I didn't hear that word yesterday about limits. But there are limits to the natural capital of this region. It's a geophysical reality we're talking about when we talk about raising cattle on a farm in a place. You know, there is only so much. And of course, we talked about water. Um, but all of these things are in play. And as I'm going to suggest to you, the community uh, and others besides the people living on the land, there's the geophysical reality. It's called, I mean, we're out here. And we're kind of in the middle of it all. Um, that's how it looks to the natural resource management people, this country, um, a, a, a disparate group of uh, disparate groups of um, geophysical um, areas. I want to table that because that's that's one reality we have to deal with. Here's another one. Um, we we don't have to invent, uh, and we don't have to improvise to do innovation, but we do have to open our minds enough to be able to put ideas on the table that don't seem acceptable. I'll come to that in a little, uh, in a minute. But yesterday I said a couple of things, for example, which is about as much to get us thinking. We have a paradigm in, in, in the agri-sector in Australia, which has been there since I was a little boy, uh, which is about bigger is better. We have to get bigger. Uh, that's a paradigm. That's just a mode of thought. That's how we all think. I'm saying you've got to put that on the table and question it and pull it apart and make sure it's actually right. Because the evidence doesn't actually always show that it is right. So we have to put that there. That's what happened to Kidsworth. They, remember, they thought they'd get bigger. They'd buy more land. Now, I could say that they bought land right next to them, which in climate terms is just compounding the risk. Had they, had they bought land, it might have been better to have bought it in another one of those NRM areas where it was more likely to rain when it wasn't raining on Kidworth Station. Um, so innovation is about all of those things there, but it's, it's about 
coming up with something that's going to lead to successful change. Innovation as a term simply means successful change. And we've got to deal with successful change in a, in a country that is seen by most people like this. It's uh, Bernard Salt's slide, this one. Um, and it reminds us that for most people, this country has never been a place they want to spend too much time in. Um, we were settled by, by sailors, the English, and we've tended to congregate on the coastlines because we don't actually find the interior of this continent a suitable or amenable place to live. And indeed, we've invented things like fly in, fly out. And we've got whole provinces now of fly in, fly out, central, east, north, and of course, people are even living in da Bali these days. And Bernard shows, of course, the great movements. The one was the maritime in the 19th century, and of course, now we're all proposing to move north. Um, up into the, into the great north where Syro will tell you that if we do all the things we could do up there, we'll actually increase the calorific output of Australian agriculture by 1%. 1%. These areas here are, are far more productive than that will ever be in terms of providing the kinds of calorific output that the world needs. So I'll leave that with you and it's worth having a look at um, in detail. It's also useful to remind us of these principles which are out of vogue. The word sustainable is not a proper word to use right now. We're using all kinds of other words. But if we don't talk about sustainability, we don't talk about the real issues, uh, the fundamental issues. I grew up on a farm. We left the farm. We went broke in the 70s. So um, I feel that intergenerational thing that people talk about. I know what it means. Um, and, and I think farmers probably better than most people get what the intergenerational, the long-term notion of sustainability is about. Sustainable, after all, simply means to continue indefinitely. That's, it's not a dirty word. It simply means to continue indefinitely. And, and, and when people say, what's sustainable development mean? And I, everyone talks about it and it all means anything, it means nothing. I say, well, it means to make sure that the things that matter most to us, most to us, the things that matter most to us, continue indefinitely. I would have thought they were things like clean air, water, um, amenity, family, all the core values we have. That's the important things. Understanding the systems basis of life means you can't ignore the geophysical stuff. You can't pretend that it's not there. That's what I was saying yesterday. Those folks in Collins Street in Melbourne are looking at spreadsheets, making decisions about people that your local bank manager has to deal with. And of course, they're not seeing the geophysical realities. They are all the social or the personal or the cultural. They are seeing a spreadsheet and they're making decisions on numbers and good on them. That's their job. We can't blame them for doing their job. But we need to accept the reality of what their job is when we talk about our job because our job's connected to their job. And these things here are about doing you know, the smart things. You don't do things that are going to stuff it for your kids. I would have thought that most of the, what I heard yesterday in a very emotional way was the precautionary principle at work. People are saying we don't want to make decisions that mean that we don't have a, proper, a property for our children or that we lock ourselves out of the options of being able to provide uh, to help them get theirs in future. And of course, understanding the planet has a life too. That, as, as I say, you can look at the biggest irrigation schemes in the Soviet Union if you want to see what man can do to the planet in the space of a generation and go and look at the Aral Sea. You know, there are some absolute unmitigated disasters where we haven't taken account of, for short-term expedience, political or otherwise, those fundamental points. And we shouldn't leave the greenies have these as theirs. These principles belong to everyone. And again, because of the politics of the, of the so-called green movement, we've actually marginalised a lot of really important principles that need to come back front and centre when we talk about um, our futures. Um, when I go, I talk about that just so you know what I believe in. That's the type of stuff I think should be happening. whole pile of stuff there, and we don't have time to go in today. But you'll see it starts with thinking beyond 20 years. I, I've worked in politics and public life for now for 25 years, and I've got to tell you, no one does this long-term stuff. It's all about my term of office. Getting into We've seen at the moment the current political uh, circus that Canberra is, with people basically telling you anything to get in, 
and then, then doing something else. And no one fessing up to saying, well, look, it's all too hard, and if we tell the folks really the truth of the matter, no one's going to elect us. That's where we've got to. And, of course, people don't have confidence anymore. Someone talked about, we talked about value chains. I want to remind you about value chains. Value chain starts with needs and opportunities, and value and values colour the value chain. Um, it's not the supply chain, uh, because these folks here, and let's call them farmers, <coughs> folks in town, banks, a whole pile of people, every, a lot of different types of people have a stake in the value chain. In your, in your business, in the value chain, government has a stake, communities have a stake. And of course, if we finish it out, it looks a bit like that. Now, we tend to think of value chain being supply chain. Value chain actually means if we took the beef industry out of this region, what would it look like? Well, a whole pile of people would leave town too, wouldn't they? It's not just the supply chain. It's the school teachers, it's the doctors, it's the whole... We all have a stake in the value of your proposition. And we've got to understand that. That's why I believe, and, and uh, Rob, you're here this morning, I think local government is going to have to find a role in this as, because one of the big things local government's doing more generally, because the other levels of government are not doing it effectively, is actually getting beyond the culverts and the roads and that's having to play a role in economic development. And it's a new role. And it's something people are still learning. But it's got to embrace this kind of approach, I think, which is holistic, understanding that um, tapping into what's actually happening in the world is where the value chain begins and ends, and, and, and making sure that uh, our part of the world benefits with it. And again, I'll come back to this, one of the other things I want to table, because I think it's relevant to thinking beyond today. Because you know, um, this, is, this is the model of what happens with most organisations. You know, if we, if we were teaching, um, I'm an uh, uh, adjunct at the business school at the University of Queensland, and you know, if you're teaching Business 101, this is Ford, this is General Motors, this is what happens. This is, you know, you, you, you start out and, and uh, people um, stay, stay afloat by imitating what's going on, looking at what the competitors are doing, etc. Everyone's got a black car, then suddenly everyone's got a white car, and then suddenly everyone's got a clock in the car and so forth. And people get to a point where they are successful enough and there's an inertia about it. So the ideas become the orthodox ideas. Um, Nokia probably thought this 10 years ago when it had, the, it, it had the phone market. Remember we all had Nokias? Who's got a Nokia phone now? Any Nokia phones in the audience? No. Yeah, one in the museum. Um, that's 10 years ago. See, they, they, got, they, got a, they didn't work out that someone was going to come along and change the game. Um, someone who actually had started with, a, with an iPad, well, not an iPad, something to play music on, and then they put a camera in and then they thought, oh, actually, it's big enough to be a phone too, we'll put a phone in. It, and that's how Apple got the phone, iPhone. Um, change of game. We are at a point, I think, in trying to solve some of the issues of Kidworth Station, where at the moment, in fact, this is where the game, where the real game is. It's actually change of game and paradigm shift is where, the, so that's, that's a bit confronting because it means that we're trying to build castles on, well, not even out of sand, but we're trying to build castles on sands that are moving uh, and, it's, and it's, it's unsteady. Uh, we are all, in fact, dealing with this, exponential, exponential growth. Um, if you go and map the world and what's happened since the 1950s, Everything you talk about looks like that, including the take-up of the iPhone. That's what success, by the way, looks like. And in a world of seven and a half billion people, that's what happens when you come up with a product that people want and people can afford and get access to. Um, and, uh, and it's also, uh, sadly, a reflection of population growth. And when we sit here in Longreach and talk about our future and what we've got to do to um, build a more uh, sustainable future for our beef producers, we need to understand that there are others out there saying, well, we probably would be better on the face of it to spend our money another way. Because all of us are in the business of competing. This is what the Grattan Institute said about regional Australia last year or the year before. Basically, that spending money out here isn't really going to deliver much value long term to the country. There'd be better ways of spending. And if you're going to spend it, make sure it's very focused, etc., etc. And that means spending more of it in Victoria. Um, that seems to be the message. And it's a message, of course, that 
uh, is confronting, but this is the reality of Australia. Uh, we live in an urban country. That is, most folks don't know where Longreach is. Uh, most people don't know where Toowoomba is. Um, it's quite confronting. Uh, and I've talked to people, several of you about this, that you just have to accept it, that you know, my secretary at 25, growing up in Brisbane, when I asked her, to, or told her I was going to Esk, didn't know where Esk was, it's 75 miles away. You know, but she'd been to Bali and Phuket. Um, her folks used to go to Sydney for the holidays, but they don't know anything about out here. I've told you this already, um, and this involves long reach, because it's not just about growing beef, it's about all those services that go with it. We've got to keep that in mind. The folks, that, those accountants have as much a stake in the future of beef production in this part of the world as the beef producers do. They might not own the family farm, although some of them might. Um, the fact is, they are all part of it, and of course they represent, I think, the great opportunity um, that we've got to keep in mind. Because our economy is changing. And if you look at uh, where things are going, of course, services through the roof, um, you can see agriculture, it's, it's, it's not on the floor, but it's, it's, and it's fairly consistent. And it's actually not going to change, despite all the hyperbole you hear um, about the future, I'll show you in a minute a Deloitte's point, we're going to be significant, and in fact agribusiness is identified as one of the big plays, but it doesn't grow like, it doesn't explode like mining does. Uh, you can see what's happening at the moment with our exports. Uh, and again, you can see who's got the political capital. I don't believe the farmers of Australia could have done to the Rudd government what um, the miners did to them in three weeks with a $30 million campaign um, talking about the mining tax, if you remember, the MRAT thing that you know, basically got Rudd kicked out of his office. Um, that's real grunt. And yet, when you look at what the future holds, we've got the big next wave. Current wave's mining, but the next wave is the Fantastic Five, Deloitte's call it. Agribusiness, gas, tourism, international education. You know, education, a $19 billion industry. Um, we've got to be thinking, uh, and one of the points I made yesterday, w universities don't teach agriculture. and There must be a yawning chasm emerging between the needs of the future industry and, and the skills that we will have available simply because the people that have got the skills will have retired or not, won't be long simply as a demographic reality. Uh, education's a $19 billion export industry. We've got to be thinking about how we get smarter and make that uh, too part of the agribusiness uh, agri vision. Uh, this is what I was talking about. The, you can see the size of it. Tourism's actually bigger in Deloitte's view as, a, as, a, as an opportunity in the future than agribusiness. Um, and I, 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 don't, I can't give you the details of that. Um, but you'll see at the moment, I guess, comparative, the current way of mining is that kind of scale. Now, I think that's probably uh, relative to the total economy. I table this simply because we talked yesterday a little bit about, and I'm going to bring them back onto the table. I think this is a cultural inhibition that we have to get over. Um, notwithstanding what Clive said about the Chinese during the week, um, I think China will be relevant to us, and we are putting our heads in the sand if we believe they won't be. The, the geopolitical strategic reality is that it is the Chinese century. So we have to accept how, or not, if not accept, at least work out how we play in that century. Now, this is the kind of growth we've seen in our industry, uh, but overall the Chinese part of it, where there's been such a fast-growing market, Australia is not playing, um, I don't think, to its, to its capacity in that market because the rate of export take-up into that area hasn't been anywhere near what we would have seen, for example, uh, with the New Zealanders, uh, with Frontera, and a much more organised approach. Two years ago, this was always a slide that threatened people. Barack Obama is now using it to remind us that the world is flat. It is also very fluid. Uh, this was supposed to mean that, you know, those jobs we had in Australia and America, they're all going to, going to China and to Indonesia or wherever, were cheap labour. Well, funnily enough, uh, post-GFC, a lot of the jobs are coming back. The world is flat, but it means the water can run both ways. And it's something to keep in mind, too, that when we talk about um, what's happening with the digitally enabled economy, and I was, I was delighted last night. I mean, this, I know it's not good everywhere, but Jamie, out at your place, I could put things on Facebook and tweet and do things, 
uh, out under the stars. I mean, that's, that's the reality. I was doing my job, in fact, and, uh, uh, during that time too. We all do it, those of us that are 24-7 connected and work in that world. Um, but that, that is the world and it means, of course, that there should be a reason for people to live here in Longreach and be doing stuff overseas or in New South Wales or wherever. Um, it's not just going to be a place limited. It might be place based, but not place limited. I, I feel, and yesterday sort of reminded me that we are at this point, that the acceptable ideas, the ones that we are comfortable with, are losing their competency. They are not delivering the range of options, the value that, that they did perhaps in 1950 or whenever. But the ideas that are, that are going to help us are not yet acceptable because we're not comfortable with them. And this is the dilemma. So that's why I talk like this because I've spent my life, in fact, the last 15 years reminding people, this bloke did this back in the 70s. He was one of the guys that, in fact, underpinned, Stafford Beer was one of the, underpinned the, um, the, the digital revolution, if you like. Uh, long before the internet was invented. Keep that in mind. So, you know, try to deal with ideas that you don't find comfortable because there's got to be something in it. And I remind people, of course, that, you know, there are multiple pathways to the future and multiple alternatives. This is perhaps an extreme version. It's certainly what I talk about to regions and, and to communities. You know, there's one way you can go that way, the monoculture, where you flog it to death. And we talked a little bit about that yesterday and some of the examples um, of overcropping, um, overstocking, you know, trying to pay the debt by taking a windfall on a two-year window when, the, when it rains um, and in the process, of course, diminishing the opportunities and the capacities of the land down the track. Um, or you do something like this, which is a bit more complex uh, and, of course, long reach by Calden. If these places are to exist in 50 years, we'll have to have these kinds of things about them. And it doesn't have to be that they've got to be Toowoomba or Brisbane, but there's got to be options and there's got to be um, uh, the complexity amongst the people that make it a place that's, uh, that functions as a community. We've talked a little bit about, and this is where a lot of the work will happen, is the incremental level of innovation. Uh, I thought Natalie took us to a couple of places yesterday where we were kind of getting into other levels of innovation. Uh, and of course, in this sector, there are all kinds of examples of innovation that goes beyond in incremental. Um, the disruptive, of course, is the game-changing stuff. It changes the nature of the game. It changes the rules of the game. The transformative stuff is, of course, when we play in a totally different game altogether. It's no longer rugby. We're no longer playing on a rugby field because we're not playing rugby. Um, and I think for beef, certainly, let's think, when we come to that level, you're talking at the level of protein. You're talking about what could challenge. Uh, we talked, uh, Bernard and I were talking about kangaroos this morning. And someone made the point yesterday about what a plague they are here. I spoke, again, I'll use my, my kid will kill me when he hears how I use him in talks, but I mean, I talked to my city kid last night about that again. He said, well, you know, people could be eating kangaroos. And they could be. Macropods, in fact, when you talk about land in Australia, seem to be far more effective, not in the plague proportion they are now, because that's, that's actually a plague and that's not natural. That's only happened because we provided the water and the and the stuff in the first place. I mean, the natural systems would have taken care of a lot of those kangaroos, but they are here because there are farms. Um, but he makes the point, and I'm thinking, you know, well, if we're thinking about disruptive innovation or transformative innovation, what can we learn from all of that? Um, is, there a, is there a place for it? I mean, in the world of protein, and I, I had an Economist article with me that I brought with me, reminding me that, you know, back in Europe, when they look at the future, uh, they, look at, uh, they look at white meat particularly because of its conversion rate. You know, it doesn't require as much feed and so forth. Uh, these are the kinds of things that, of course, that can play. And it mightn't be that the innovation, in fact, is in your industry. It might be among your consumers. And you have to keep that in mind, that there's two players in the game. There's the supplier and the consumer. And of course, as we're seeing at the moment in retail, there's quite a lot of um, disruptive innovation happening. I, I'm going to run out of time, but I just want to remind you that at the moment, and I'm wearing something here that tells you that I'm an ambassador for the Queensland plan. One of the people that were given, the 15 that have been given the hospital pass of keeping the Queensland plan nation alive as the government tries to work out what to do with it. And that's not for the public, by the way. Um, you know, they, they'll have their response later in the year. 
Uh, I actually am quite passionately supportive of the Queensland plan because it's consistent with what I've been saying for years, which is that we do have to think longer term. Funnily enough, 78,000 people did whip out and have their say and take an active role. And indeed, not surprisingly, we got a lot of good common sense um, that tells us that people do get what sustainable development's all about. Their view and their aspirations for the longer term for Queensland are in fact to totally consistent with what a sustainable, de sustainable vision would look like. Um, and of course, regions is front and centre of what people want. But you know, this is a big ask, making it attractive to study, work and live for bright minds and trained professionals. Doesn't mention beef, but I guess the point is, um, it sees a world, and Queensland is saying we want a state, in fact, where not everyone lives in South East Queensland, in fact, people live in other places. And indeed, that our regions have centres of excellence, and I guess that's one of the things we're trying to do at our university. But centres of excellence don't have to just be universities. They can be knowledge clusters of like-minded people in a region working together to make themselves a world-regarded source of expertise or product. And I think, you know, in, when we talk about uh, the future of the beef industry, I'd ask you, you know, what is the knowledge cluster of this area? What does it look like if we were to say we're going to set up a business of beef production uh, that gets beyond the current model? Uh, and we want to firstly just look at the knowledge we have. Forget about the cows, forget about the land. Who has the grunt here that can tell us um, how to grow uh, cattle or uh, run a successful business in a land like this and lands like this all over the world because we're not the only place that's quite like this. Um, so coming at it through that perspective I think is important and there is an industry base to that kind of thinking. I said yesterday that um, all of what we're talking about of course adds up to making strategic decisions but what happens because getting out of your own mindset getting out of that inheritance that you bring to the table, is that we often sit down and solve the problems that we want to solve rather than the problems that should be solved. And of course, in the process, we often solve the wrong problems. We get the right answer to the wrong problem uh, and that doesn't take us anywhere. Uh, that's why I think Jamie's initiative and those that you have worked with him in doing this, I hope this goes on because this can't be a one day thing or a two day thing. Um, You've got to uh, take on the, the porter point here of you know, developing a strategy for the industry for yourselves in this region requires ongoing uh, consideration of these kinds of basic points. And that's not about, as, as the accountants themselves said yesterday, there is a limit to how much you can be efficient, how, how, how much cost you can cut. There's got to be a point where uh, you move from um, the efficiency side of the equation to the creation side, the value creation side, which is what are the alternative business propositions we can bring to the table? Is it quality of people? Is it management? Uh, is it a different product? Is it niche marketing? Whatever, whatever those questions are, that's part of the creative process. Strategy is the creation of a unique and valuable position involving a d different set of activities to the ones that are currently under play. So, Jamie, this is not probably what you uh, thought I might talk about, but I'm going to put it on the table anyway, because as you address the issues of the individual farmers, these are the kinds of things that more generally as a community we should be asking ourselves. I assume that we expect or want to have a beef industry like something like we've got here in 50 years or 40 years or whatever, not that we could really think that far in detail. But these are the kinds of questions we should be asking ourselves, and Rob as a mayor uh, and as a community leader, these are the kinds of things that your council, I think, needs to be asking itself. How do we ground the future in alternatives? Uh, you know, when you've got no alternative, you've got pretty much what we're talking about with Kidworth Station. And that was the, that's the challenging, confronting reality of it. The, 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 although Tim did make a point last night that, you know, as, as players, they've kind of done as well as anyone was going to do in that situation. But nevertheless, they don't have the options that you require in a system that is continuous and is dynamic, that is forever changing. And that's what a resilient system is. It's one that's growing, it's one that's preserving, and indeed, it's often at this point here where we, we work out how to do something really well and make a success of it. It's a bit the same thing as we were talking about a minute ago about organisations. They become inert, complacent in their own success. Um, Regions, industries can do the same thing. You know, we, we know how to do this stuff. All we need is rain. 
or governments to get out of the way or someone to change a policy. We know how to do our business. Don't tell us how to do it because we've got to this point. That is in fact a point in most systems where systems are most resilient, I'm sorry, most, most vulnerable to disruptive interventions. Um, it could be a forest, it could be a successful system of any kind you like, natural, art, um, human, whatever, organisational, business, uh, and of course those that don't deal with the, the shocks go in, are disturbed and decline, and some die, some come back. And of course uh, how you manage those properties has a big say in that after a rain event. And these are the kinds of questions you might ask if we're thinking about um, our property. What's the, you know, this is one of the things about it, you know, what, what are the stocking, what are the limits to, the, to, that, the, to that property? Um, we saw in the, when the rain time came, they, they got a whole pile of stock and, uh, and uh, increased the number of cows, etc. Uh, and uh, obviously uh, went to what they thought were the carrying capacities of the land in a good time. But of course, once it dry, went dry again, um, that's the cycle out here. Um, but it's got to be accepted that there are different limits at different times and different conditions. Limits in themselves are dynamic. Um, and what will be the crucial factors shaping the transition to getting this capacity to be resilient? When you pull it apart, I'm just about finished, and you'll see where I'm going. When you take something like resilience, don't confuse resilience with stoicism. Don't confuse resilience with being a good bloke. Resilience is actually a capacity to, to deal with change, bounce back, yes, but bounce back in terms that are uh, compatible with the system's uh, core aspirations, if you like. And when you pull a community apart, you get a whole pile of things. Diverse and innovation of economy, leadership, the different beliefs, sense of purpose, community levels of engagement, um, the wider systems. Have a look at this because these slides will be available, but it all adds up to this thing here, people, networks, linkages and interaction. How we function as a community is important to solving the issues or addressing the issues that people find in their individual properties or businesses. And values, structures and strategies. You can't have a strategy if you ignore your values, and, but you can't let values necessarily get in the way of that they are core to you, and this is where big decisions have to be made. We talked about it yesterday. When is the time to sell? When is the time to preserve the more important things like things like your life, your family, than dogged determination to stay on the property? These things are confronting, and they are at this point, because these things can only flow when those, when those things are clear. Um, so have a look at that in terms of how resilience uh, flows out, if you like, into, into strategy. Because as I conclude this talk, I think we're a kind of, we spent a lot of time looking at this here, the today stuff. This is our region. This is our property, our region, our district, our sector. We don't get enough time to do this stuff, think beyond, other, only in negative terms. We don't tend to think too much about the positive stuff because we're too busy doing this stuff. And you know, we don't get to do the tomorrow stuff, which is the top row. You know, the, the net gain, how will what we do down here make a, make a positive contribution, not only to my family, to my business or whatever, but to my community. And I'm suggesting that, you know, that's why it has to be more than the individual sitting in the broader context. What's the regional vision? What's the new thinking? What are the products and services that this region will be famous for in 25 years? Um, and you'll find that when you get into that discussion, all these things are going to come to mind. You know, the, the your sense of the future, the things that make for the sustainability of the region, the essential natural systems, the people, how the things interplay. Uh, boom and bust, by the way, is such a dynamic interaction, but it's an unsustainable interaction. Um, Communities, of course, have to have these kinds of things. You have to have complexity. That is diversity of ages, diversity of skills. And there has to be in a community some sense of mutual mutuality. That is, we don't live as total strangers, uh, alienated, uh, relying on uh, um, whatever it is that keeps us, keeps us there. But it, it, to be in a positive situation, you've got to have that before you can do this type of stuff here, to change, to adapt. 
and the other things there. I'm, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to... And I'll be confronting at the end. Um, has anyone ever heard of a concept called biomimicry? Biomimicry means to mimic nature. Uh, it's a whole thought movement internationally. There's a lady called Janine Benyus who's written quite a famous book on it called Biomimicry. You know, um, to, make, uh, to make aluminium, you know what we do to well, it's electrified, it's, it's uh, frozen electricity essentially. We use a lot of heat, a lot of, a lot of energy. But a mollusk can do the same thing that's just as hard and just as light uh, in seawater at room temperature. Um, the, um, the cobweb, uh, I'm just giving you examples of you know, some of the things that nature does. Uh, cobweb is one of the strongest fabrics that we've yet discovered on this planet. Uh, it's as strong as Kevlar, uh, something we make again with lots of chemicals. Um, biomimicry means these are the principles. <clears throat> and basically this is how any natural system works. If you, if, if, before humans get near it, um, it does all these things. I suggest that these are the kinds of things that as, as communities we need to keep in mind. And indeed, look at this. You know, here's Kidworth. Avoid excesses and overbuilding. Tapping the power of limits. Understanding the limits so that you don't go over them and cut off options for the future. <clears throat> Rob uh, O'Brien and I were talking about this last night. On the, I used to be the head of the Office of Clean Energy here in Queensland. And uh, I know that it, cost, it used to cost $17,000 a megawatt in some parts of Queensland to provide electricity. Very unsustainable. And it could only happen at great waste uh, and expense to the taxpayer. There were smarter ways of doing things. You know, uh, one of the things we've got to see in a state like Queensland is disaggre disaggregated energy systems. Um, and, of course, the greatest disaggregated system you'll see is a, is a, is a, <clears throat> is a natural system because it's drawing its, everything, it's, all its energy is coming from outside, from the sun. Uh, fitting form to function efficiently. You know, these, are, these are design principles as much as anything, but you'll find them when you start looking at and <clears throat> requiring local expertise. So you see, no one out there can actually replace you guys. You're the greatest asset this region has because your knowledge collectively <clears throat> is the local expertise that will make beef production in this part of the world sustainable. No smart ass is going to come from Melbourne or from from New York or from Germany or anywhere else to tell you how to do it better than how you can do it yourselves. Because you've got a body of knowledge, uh, like any local system, that you can't get from somewhere else. So let me <coughs> close out. <coughs> of course, we all hear about the French. Love this. The French value their countryside and they, and they pay for it. The common agricultural policy comes out of the French love of the countryside. The subsidies that they give. You'll see them in a supermarket where the Italian tomatoes cost a fraction of what the tomatoes from Mildura cost. And it's because someone uh, in Europe has paid half the, half the cost of the can as a subsidy. Um, I don't think the Common Agricultural Program is the answer to Australia's rural future. I always say to people, you can go and find other ideas, and you've heard some good ones here in the past 24 hours that will come from elsewhere. But those ideas can only be insights. They can't be the solution. That's something that only one plus many can do. And again, to be, to be optimistic, this country once looked like this. You see, the humans have been here before and have built communities all over the place, 200 nations, in fact, on this continent before the white man came in 1788. So, and interestingly, these days, some of the discussions I hear, particularly down on the Downs with the coal seam gas stuff, you'd swear when the farmers were talking, you were hearing the blackfellas of 100 years ago, the way they are being talked about in terms of things like rights of access and dispossession and so forth. So keep that in mind that, you know, um, we can build our own version of that map. It can be the better map than Bernard Salt's map. Bernard Salt's map, to me, is, a, is, a, is, is, is a, an awful scenario. But at the moment, it's the one that seems to be promising to be the most likely if things don't change. And I think rural Australia um, takes more initiative in, a, in framing its own proposition. So thanks very much. I hope I've given you something to think about. Um, and I hope I've confronted something uh, in your thoughts. Cheers. People can create real opportunities for each other. 
and I implore you to join AgriHive as a platform to be able to explore those opportunities and to build resilience in our rural regions.